Mount Mulligan is not that well known around Australia, but it is a fascinating place and also site of one of the worst mining disasters in Australian history. We decided to visit the location, but wanted to make a day of it and drive there in a roundabout way. We headed west out from Ravenshoe and then northwest through a remote area known as Silver Valley. The windy back roads through the valley are a favourite with four wheel drive owners who can traverse off road from the highway to Georgetown across to the highway that leads to the town of Chilligo. Our plan was to make our way over the scenic mountain range through to the town of Irvinbank and then head northwest to Petford before taking a short bitumen drive east to Dimbula. Dimbula is the closest town to Mount Mulligan. It's the point where you leave bitumen and head north into the bushland to get to the mine site. It doesn't actually take that long to get to the site. It's around 50 kilometres from Dimbula on what I'd describe as a pretty good dirt road. You know you're getting close to the site when the mountain range comes into view. It's magnificent. The conglomerate and sandstone mountain range is known to local Jungan people as Narrabulgan. The Jungan people began living in the mountain about 40,000 years ago apparently and they ceased camping on the range about 600 years ago. The range was named Mount Mulligan after prospector James Venture Mulligan by his colleagues who had joined him on a gold finding expedition in 1874. The name Mount Mulligan was later also given to the town that grew in the shadows of the range's escarpment. Although still officially gazetted, Mount Mulligan is now a ghost town. It has a single cemetery, a single occupied residence, a single chimney stack and the overgrown remains of the once busy mining operations and electricity generator. In the 2016 census, Mount Mulligan had a population of four people. It is the site of the Mount Mulligan mine disaster, Queensland's worst. So I'll actually read out what's on the plaque there and uh, it'll give you a sense of what this place is all about. The day the devil wept, Sunday 18th of September 1921 was hot and the cricket game was called off. In the cool of the evening, however, an impromptu party was held in the local hall. The girls from the hotel were talking into providing sandwiches, cakes and biscuits, and the town sung and danced until midnight. The single men returned to the hotel, still in high spirits, and some had pillow fights. It was to be their send-off. At 9.25am the next day there was a horrific explosion in the mine which killed all 75 men in it. The explosion was heard 60 kilometres away at Mount Malloy, but worst of all by the children lining up for school and the wives at home, instantly knowing that their fathers and husbands were dead. 80 men were not down the mine that morning and they rushed to the scene and fought through the wreckage of the concrete entrance fan house. The blacksmith, well out from the tunnel mouth, was knocked unconscious by the blast. Driven back by carbon monoxide, several small fans were brought in and two caged birds, a canary and native finch were used to test the air. As the gas door became too high, the birds suffered distress and all retreated. The canary escaped, the finch became the hero of the operation. The first two men found, Thomas Evans and Martin O'Grady, survived until the following Monday. By Thursday, 56 bodies had been recovered. In all, 74 bodies were initially recovered, the last and eight on 8 February 1922. Father and son died together that day and left 56 orphans. Health and generous donations were forthcoming from all over Australia. To this time, no deaths had occurred at Mount Mulligan and there was no cemetery. The ground was quickly consecrated and the burials held. Even today, to visit that graveyard and read the headstones is enough to make the devil weep. There you go, that's the history of Mount Mulligan Mine. Very sad. After reading the story of the site, we took the opportunity to actually drive up to the mine entrance. The roadway in is well marked, but probably only suitable to four-wheel drives. After passing the remnants of the mining operation, the road opens out to a small clearing right in front of the mine entrance, which you can still see clearly today. After a nice little detour over some rough terrain and a bit of fun in the four-wheel drive, we were back on the track headed home. This is one of those must-see historical sites for anyone with an off-road vehicle travelling through North Queensland.